Elder Thomas B. Singer is, is credited with being the first missionary to enter the Czech Republic in 1884. He baptized Anthon just in June 1884, but unfortunately was soon thereafter imprisoned, tried, and banished from the country. Despite his deportment, he returned to the mission 44 years later at the age of 84 to continue his work. Czechoslovakia was organized as a mission on July 24, 1929, and was dedicated for the preaching of the gospel by Elder John A. Witso. There were, at the time of the organization, seven local members in the country. Elder Arthur Gaith was chosen to preside over the mission and led eight missionaries from the East German mission, none of which had any former Czech language experience. One of the missionaries was Elder Wallace F. Toronto, who was later to preside over the Czech mission off and on for the next 32 years. On June 24 and 25, eight, um, 1938, the presidents of nine European missions met in Switzerland under the direction of President J. Reuben Clark, Jr. President Clark was a member of the church's first presidency and was also well uh, respected in diplomatic circles in the United States government. President Clark had two important roles in meeting with the mission presidents of Europe. The first, he was the annual General Authority representative to tour the, tour the European missions. Secondly, there were serious political undercurrents which were destabilizing the balance of power in some of the Northern European countries which hosted the missionaries. As a part of the conference, President Clark made a number of recommendations to the gathered mission presidents. His recommendations included the creation of a contingency fund in each mission that would enable the presidents to move their missionaries to safety, to the safety of a neutral country and not be dependent upon the fluctuation of local currency. President Clark further suggested that the mission presidents conferred together about what they would do with their missionaries in the event of the foregoing problems. Both of these objectives were met by the assembled presidents, but none of them could have anticipated that it was but a matter of weeks before each of these plans was pushed into effect. On March 15 and 16, 1939, in a surprise move, the German army invaded Czechoslovakia. And, without, and within hours, Czechoslovakia was under Nazi rule without the resistance that would have typically been expected. On that warm summer morning, Sister Martha Toronto, wife of the president, was in the hospital, recuperating from a recent birth of the Toronto's third child. She heard the commotion in the streets, saw the concerns of staff members, but initially had no idea of its cause. There were rumblings of every sort, she remembered, from vehicles large and small riding over the cobblestone street, noise of people running and shouting, and even much unrest and chatter among the nurses. Ultimately, she inquired of one of the employees the cause of all the commotion, and she was answered that a surprise German invasion was in progress. She called her husband and, con and he confirmed the news of the invasion. President Toronto assured me, she said, that everything was all right, except that we were now being ruled by the Germans. Elder Milton Madsen recorded, they took over all the radio stations and government buildings so quickly that the Czechs offered no resistance. Numerous other restrictions were initiated and implemented against the locals and the missionaries alike. Each of the missionaries who witnessed the invasion mentioned the tanks, the troop carriers, the airplanes flying overhead, 
and the numerous soldiers in the streets. Although it was strictly forbidden, many of them took pictures of the invasion, which was in process, making this a rare visual documentation of a very significant historical event. A bright side of the invasion, at least for the elders, was that the missionaries would not have to leave the country because the invasion and takeover had gone very smoothly. The downside, of course, to both the local uh, members and the missionaries was the fear and uncertainty that the occupation of foreign troops uh, bent on ruling the nation had for the people. We had to be very careful, remembered Elder Robert Lee. There sure was a lot of rumors floating around about a war. Lee further recalled, I went down and took one shot with my camera of the broken windows and I got stopped by the police. I explained who I was and they let me go without further questioning. What the country was experiencing, however, was anything but normal. As the time went on, false arrests, concentration camps, and executions took care of the leaders and the artisans whose skills were lost when they died. With the overthrow of the Czech government, the missionaries were still allowed by the church leaders to remain, due in part that the church still had missionaries in two separate German missions, and the peaceful takeover made the Czech government now under German control, uh, where the missionaries were recognized, welcome, and to a limited degree successful. The mission had to make adjustments to comply with the regulations of and to avoid any problems with the German-controlled government. President Toronto advised the missionaries to discontinue tracting, not because it was against the law, but because he decided it was prudent that they not be any more visible to the government than necessary. In addition, all public meetings of more than three people were outlawed without specific permission. And at night, a strict curfew was ordered and no one was allowed on the streets. President Toronto restricted the elders from teaching contacts, restricted the elders to teaching contacts they already knew, and those referred to them by local members. They concentrated most of their efforts on visiting individuals already members. Further, missionaries were also expected to report periodically by telephone to the mission office. Elder Verdell R. Bishop served for a time as the mission secretary, and it, hit, and it was his responsibility to receive these telephone reports. When the German government imposed restrictions on public gatherings, the church was already in compliance. Nevertheless, even the strongest members felt the pressures of the occupation and worried about what the new regime meant for the church in Czechoslovakia. The saints, and especially the missionaries, were never quite certain when they might be breaking the law. And with the people anxious and preoccupied, the missionaries enjoyed only limited success after the invasion. People became very careful who they would talk to and what they said, as they never knew who might turn them into the Nazi secret police. While meeting with a branch in, of the church in Prague, President and Sister Toronto related an experience that illustrates just how tense conditions were. Sister Toronto described the fear that gripped the mostly Czechoslovakian congregation as a Nazi officer stepped into the meeting hall. Quote, we were all in church on Sunday morning attending a program. The service was drawing to a close but was still in progress when the back door of the meeting house opened and in stepped a tall Nazi officer. The congregation, members and friends alike, froze in their seats. A German officer appearing as he did meant but one thing to us all, arrest and imprisonment. After hesitating a moment or two, he smiled and started walking toward the front of the hall, where President Toronto was, had been presiding over the meeting. The president arose and walked toward him and spoke to him in his native German. 
We all sat like terrified mummies in our seats. At last, speaking now in Czech, Wally turned to us and announced that this young officer had something to say to us and would speak to us in German. President Toronto translated. It will be remembered that President Toronto had served as a full-time missionary in Germany. Brothers and sisters, he said, I have come here not on an appointment of my own uh, not on an appointment, but of my own choosing. I come here to Czechoslovakia as a servant of my government. I know we have brought you considerable distress and dismay. We have caused already much suffering. Nevertheless, you and I have something in common, something which oversteps the boundaries of race, language, and color. You and I have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Despite the fact that I speak German and you speak Czech, yet because of the gospel we, we still speak in common terms. The time is coming when we shall know this better than ever before. The officer then reaffirmed his faith in the restored gospel, asked if he could participate with the branch in their worship services. When he finished speaking, the members welcomed him with great emotion. For the next several months, and until he was reassigned to another area, the officer attended the branch meetings and some social activities in Prague. Throughout this period, missionaries continued to work. Two new, no new missionaries were sent to the mission, and the older missionaries were sent home as their time elapsed, and they were released. On June 3, 1939, President Toronto received a letter from the First Presidency, which in part directed, quote, In view of the political changes, it is deemed advisable to attach the branches of the church in Czechoslovakia to the East German mission. You are therefore authorized to close the office of the Czechoslovak mission as of July 1, 1939. President Toronto was surprised by the directive. He did not, after some contemplation, believe that the First Presidency was fully aware of how much political conditions had stabilized since the German takeover. By mid-June, he attended a conference of European mission presidents in Switzerland and discussed with Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, member of the Twelve in charge of touring the missions, the condition of his mission. Elder Smith presided at the conference and subsequently visited with each of the, church, uh, the mission presidents in Europe during the summer of 1939. The concerns over political conditions and the prospects of war must have been a major topic of discussion and even some concern during these conferences. Elder Smith interviewed each of the mission presidents and endorsed President Toronto's position that political conditions did not necessitate the closure of the mission. He directed President Toronto to send a report of his views um, of the situation to the First Presidency. Elder Smith likewise wrote a letter with his own assessments and recommendations. Before the end of June 1939, President Toronto received a cable from the per First Presidency deferring his release and delaying the evacuation of the mission. One of the first and retrospectively most significant problems experienced in the mission occurred in July of 1939, when two American missionaries, Elder Robert Lee and Rulon Payne, attempted to help a Jewish woman with American dollars by exchanging it for local currency. The exchange had not been, had not been made, although it was intended. The missionaries, believing that they were assisting a local member to avoid incarceration and or deportation, while there was money to be made by the missionaries or anyone else for the exchange of American dollars on the black market, the elders were not intending to break the currency laws of the country. Elder Lee explained, I believed I was doing nothing strictly forbidden. 
For example, sorry, several of our brethren, including myself, President Toronto afterwards told the First Presidency, had assisted some of our Jewish friends to place deposits outside of the country in exchange for check crowns. When the Germans took over things, a strict ordinance was passed forbidding the sale of money outside of authorized German banks. Despite knowing of the ordinance, most of the missionaries had never experienced the enforcement of it and were consequently not strictly in compliance with it. On July 10th, Monday morning, 1939, elders Lee and Payne, serving together in Prague, both of whom um, had, had money, traveler's checks, and personal checks from home, and determined to exchange them and contacted an individual to make the exchange. The individual contact, contacted was an undercover Gestapo agent. Another missionary explained, a Jewish lady who had come to all of our church activities had been asking us for American money and seemed desperate. Lee received $50 from his parents and he asked the mission president if he could give some of the money to help this sister. He was told that he could if he thought it would help. Elder Lee called the lady and she told them to meet her at a certain place. When they went there, a car pulled up with the lady in the back seat. She motioned them to get in, and as they did, she stepped out, and the Gestapo agents climbed in. Three agents arrested the two elders and took them to the headquarters for preliminary questioning, and then to prison. Later, armed with information on where the missionaries lived, agents went to their apartment uh, where they searched for evidence against them. In their thorough search, the Gestapo agents found and confiscated what was classified as incriminating evidence, including some uncashed checks to them from other missionaries, a violation of the Ch uh, German's currency laws, and a book of Czech poetry, which included one that was construed to have communistic overtones a violation of propaganda statutes. Unfortunately, and in a good case of bad timing, two additional American elders, Verdell R. Bishop and Asel Moulton, who had not seen Lee and Payne during the day, nor had they received their check-in call, went first to the chapel uh, to look for them. None of the members had reported seeing them, and so they decided to go to their apartment. They arrived at their apartment at the exact same time the Germans were performing their search. Elder Bishop recorded, the door swung open and we were looking into the barrel of a German Luger and were also taken into custody. The room was torn apart, suitcases, clothing, and belongings were strewn about in complete disorder. They had gone through everything and thrown things all around. Elders Bishop and Moulton were also taken to headquarters where the a Gestapo agent waved a revolver at Elder Bishop's head and threatened to shoot him if he failed to tell the truth. The Germans immediately proceeded to search us, taking our passports, wallets, and then began interrogating us and grilled us until after midnight. Elders Bishop and Moulton were ultimately also imprisoned. Later, two of their Gestapo agents took us over to our apartment and went through everything there, even to the prying off of the heels of our shoes, but they found nothing. The only difference between the arrests of the two companionships was that the later two elders had no idea why they were arrested, and in retrospect might have been released except for the personal checks bearing their names that had been found in the possession of Elders Lee and Payne. Remember that point uh, for a little later on. 
Worse still, President of Toronto was not apprised of the elders' arrests and remained unaware of their incarceration until the following morning, Elder Moulton, the mission secretary, was brought to the mission office by a government agent. Elder Moulton had in his possession a key to a cash box in the mission office. The key was of interest to the agent, and he took Moulton and the key to the office to find what it fit. The cash box in the mission office contained the check mission contingency funds in British pounds and in American dollars and was kept to be used in the, in the event of an emergency. These monies were to be held in case of an evacuation from the country or even from the continent became necessary. When the agent was shown the box which fit the key, he was distracted momentarily by Elder Moulton while President Toronto quickly removed most of the cash which would have in itself been incriminating against the individuals, including the President, and against the mission. The cash was hurriedly stuffed in a drawer and consequent, consequently the agent confiscated the box, the remainder of its contents, and re returned Elder Moulton to his cell at the penitentiary without any explanation to the President. While there, Moulton was able to alert the President that he and three other elders were all in jail, each in a separate cell. The Pongkrok Penitentiary, uh, in which the missionaries had been remanded, was supposed to be the most modern in Czechoslovakia. Despite what it was supposed to be, it was already grossly overcrowded. The missionaries were stripped except for their underclothing and were separated from each other and put into a cell measuring approximately 7 by 19 feet. The cells were meant for only one person, but two other prisoners, in addition to the missionary, um, for a total of three, shared each cell. They slept on straw mats, which rested on the floor, and we always had to sleep with our feet pointed toward the door, they remembered. The only furnishing in the cell was a Susie, which served as a toilet, wash basin, wash tub in some cases. The door of the cell was made of solid wood with a small peep door about eight or nine inches square in it. The door could be opened from the outside at the pleasure of the guard. Through the smaller door was a peep hole which was fixed so that the prisoner could not see out. The inmates could talk with the other prisoners who were in their, their cell but were not allowed to speak with anyone outside. Elders Lee learned that Elder Payne was in the next cell. Since they were not allowed to talk, they developed a code system. We tapped on the wall so we could talk, communicate, to one another through the walls. Supposedly, each day the prisoners were allowed a short period out of doors, wherein they were permitted to walk around the prison yard or to exercise, but again they were not allowed to visit. Elders Lee and Payne learned that when they would bring us out, they would line us up in front of the cells, and so Elder Payne would be in the first be in the first in his line, and I would be the last in my line. Therefore, we would stand together. We could pass th things back and forth, messages, items of food or something like that. The food served to the inmates was enough in quantity but lacked any strength-building vitamins. After doing our exercise, Pres Elder Lee remembered, we would be almost entirely exhausted. Another missionary remembered that it consisted of a bean meal bread and a watery, weak broth made from potato peelings. There was some variety in the way it was prepared, but each day the prisoners were served soup, alternating each day with beans, peas, and lentils, and black bread, which often had sawdust 
filler baked into it. Sunday was a special day. For breakfast, we got barley coffee, unsweetened, and our black bread. For dinner, we got noodle soup, which was the best we received during the whole week. Meat was rarely served, and when we got any, it was in very small portions and was so hard it could not be cut. Occasionally, they were served a bowl of rice and bacon, which was never cooked, and we ate that cold with lots of black bread. For entertainment or distraction, the elders passed their time remembering scriptures, uh, experiences, memories, and of their families. Two of the elders separately reported of pressing small pieces of bread into squares and of allowing it to dry on the windowsill. They each created a small pair of dice, which was marked and rolled on the floor of the cell to pass the time. Another made some unsophisticated chess pieces. He learned from an Aust Austrian cellmate how to play the game, a form of recreation he continued to enjoy throughout the remainder of his life. Still another made a, a miniature set of playing cards. The cards were made from safety pin cards that Sister Toronto had furnished him since he was not allowed, uh, not allowed or provided any writing utensils, he wrote the different symbols and numbers on the cards using match heads. Matches were available in the cells since the only light inside, the, inside were candles provided by the guards. Elder Lee noted, Locked in a cell, you're not going to burn anything down. Sister Toronto or one of the other missionaries, were allowed to visit the prison once a week with a fresh bundle of freshly laundered clothing for each of the elders and to retrieve their dirty clothes for cleaning and for subsequent exchanges. Never, however, were they allowed to see the prisoners. After learning where they were incarcerated, President Toronto repeatedly went to the prison um, to or to government officials to secure the release of the four elders, still not knowing why they had been arrested. Since no official charges had been filed against them, it made it a guessing game. Only, uh, only once was the president allowed to see the elders, and that through the demands of the American consulate in Czechoslovakia. On this occasion, the elders were permitted into another part of the prison to shower. Only once, in addition to that, were the, were the missionaries shaved during their imprisonment, and that was done for them. During his frequent visits, President Toronto was told a different story about what charges could be brought against the missionaries. Further, depending on what the charges were, on a particular day, changed what it would cost to get them out. The fines charge uh, ranged from $1,000 each to $10,000 each for their release. For the, more than a month, each time President Toronto visited the prison, the amount of the bail seemed to change as did the reasons for the detention. Initially, the elders were supposed to were supposedly held due to a violation of currency laws. Later, it was because of literature found in the Brethren's quarters. The case had taken on a political aspect and would have to be transferred to the Chief Gestapo office. On one of the occasions, President Toronto visited one of the high dignitaries uh, when he was going to visit one of the high dignitaries, he said to his wife, You know, Martha, having these missionaries in trouble as long as they have been has given me a tremendous opportunity to learn more of the German language. I'm learning words and phrases that I never knew existed, especially about government and politics. He came home a few weeks later, she remembered, after a visit with the man directly in charge of our case, and he said in effect, 
I'm afraid I really blew it today. I was so mad at air so-and-so that I called him some pretty terrible names, and I don't know what the words mean. It took an awfully lot to make Wally mad, and he usually could control his anger, but this day he hadn't. He went directly to his German dictionary to find out what he, those words meant. He never told me what they were, but he exclaimed, Oh my, oh dear, and immediately sat down and wrote a letter of apology to the agent. It was really quite funny in retrospect, and luckily it did no real harm in the long run. Two days later, he awoke and said to me, Martha, I have a strange feeling that I should go down to the Gestapo office today. I said, well, why don't you go? Because I'd never get in to see Dr. Blummelberg. He had to wait almost two hours in line two days earlier, so how could I ever get in without an American consul present today? He dismissed the thought. Later in the morning, he came out into the kitchen and he said, I just can't lose the feeling that I should go there today. I know, but I know it is useless. I urged him to go anyway. He packed his briefcase full of favorable information about Germany and the Deseret News articles, Book of Mormon and German, and other things that might help him, and off he went. He came home several hours later and said, you just won't guess what happened. I was standing in the long line of people waiting my turn when the guard came up and one by one he eliminated the people standing in line in front of me. As he approached me, he said, Oh, you are the man from the American Embassy. You may go right in. I tried to hide my surprise, and I didn't think it expedient to tell him that I wasn't who he thought I was. President Toronto said of this experience, the case was finally transferred to the Chief Gestapo office where, I was in, where it was being investigated from the political angle. Finally, the wheels of bureaucracy began to turn with pressure from the United States Consulate and from President Alfred C. Reese of the East German Mission in Berlin who contacted the American legation and be, who began to pressure high government officials. When I we visited, we were told that all the political charges had been dropped. With this new development, a meeting was arranged by the American consul in Prague for President Toronto meet, to meet with the Gestapo chief, Dr. Bommelberg. The Gestapo chief told the mission president, among other things, that a law had been broken and that fines up to 10 times the amount involved could be assessed and imprisonment for up to six months or both could be imposed. Dr. Bommelberg then offered the release of the prisoners for 5,000 American dollars each. This was a real deal, since the head of the Department of Currency had set the fine earlier at $10,000, but that since he wished to do us justice, that he had reduced it to $5,000. Ironically, one of the holdups in the case that perhaps kept it from being resolved much earlier was that no one seemed to know how much money was involved in the case. At the subsequent meeting with President Toronto, President, Bommel, uh, President Toronto explained to Eric Bommelberg the missionary program of the church, shared a copy of the Deseret News, showing the two young German officers visiting Salt Lake City and some positive comments about his visits. He then responded, Mr. Toronto, you have a rich church which could pay the required fine upon a moment's notice. The statement helped to remove any doubt as to what the government's motives were in holding the missionaries for so long. President Toronto had long suspected that the Germans were trying to exact as much money from the church as possible. President Toronto told the agent 
that it was now perfectly clear that there were no serious charges against our missionaries, but that they are being held only for the purpose of extracting from our church a great amount of American dollars, which the German government sorely needs. We are, we are willing to pay a reasonable fine for our men breaking the currency regulations of the country, but not the great amount which you have required of us. If it is foreign currency you want, then let me point out to you that you are endangering one of your finest sources of income. Do you know that for the past few years there have been from 250 to 300 Mormon missionaries laboring in Germany to teach your people the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you know that each one of these missionaries brings into your country each month from $40 to $50? Figure it out for yourself, doctor, and you will find that it totals from approximately $10,000 to $15,000 each month. President Toronto finished with his warning. Now, doctor, unless you come to terms and deal reasonably with us, I shall request our church to immediately withdraw every American missionary from the German Reich. Of course, the president was bluffing. There were less than 200 missionaries then serving in all of the German-occupied territories, and President Toronto did not have the authority to remove his own missionaries from his mission, much less from all of Germany. But the bluff seemed to work. It had a positive effect since Dr. Bommelberg picked up the phone after making some figures and called the agent in charge of the case and told him to come to terms with President Toronto. On August 23, 1939, the Financial Administration agreed to a fine totaling about $250 each, or just over $1,000 for all four of the missionaries, rather than the variously inflated amounts that had been demanded earlier. After their release, each of the missionaries met individually with their mission president, and then is when he learned the details of the case. None of the missionaries reported any tor torture, mistreatment, or abuse beyond being underfed and nourished and not knowing when they would be released or why they were being held or when they could be released. We learned, President Toronto, to the First Presidency, that the amount involved in the case was not thousands of dollars, as they had suggested, but $400, which they had exchanged. Ironically, most of the money exchanges transpired before any of the ordinances were made unlawful, which predated the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. In retrospect, President Toronto further caustically noted, Brother Bishop, who had, confu who had confessed to no sale of funds, had been held for 44 days together with the rest of the missionaries because he had on his person an American Express traveler's check for $10. When the elders were finally released from prison after their significantly reduced fine was paid, they desired to return to a degree of normalcy. Normalcy, however, was a long way off and never was realized by the missionaries while still in Czechoslovakia. The missionaries had their personal possessions returned to them. Um, in an interesting... Uh, experience, the, the missionaries had little money, pardon me, little memory after 44 days of what property had been taken from them. Elder Bishop reminisced, I must have had 13 check crowns taken, which I never got back. Elder Payne, on the other hand, received his belongings and went through them to see if anything was missing. From a compartment in his wallet, he extracted a 500-crown bill that he had in a secret place. Apparently surprised by the thoroughness of the Gestapo in searching their apartments, they had missed what was in his wallet. 
And he said as he was leaving to the Gestapo agents, how come you guys missed this? Which was probably a dangerous thing to do. The health of the missionaries was one of the most immediate problems that was faced by the missionaries upon their release from imprisonment. Elder Lee, for example, lost 40 pounds during the 44-day ordeal of imprisonment. Elder Bishop and Lee and Payne continued to feel the effects of their undernourishment for the remainder of their lives. Elder Bishop recorded, My experience in the prison had left my stomach in, a pretty, in pretty bad shape. I couldn't hold anything on it for very long. It was weeks after I got home before I felt comfortable eating food again. His wife, interviewed, reported further her belief that her husband's stomach trouble that ultimately brought about his death was a result of the conditions that he had endured while in the Pancrock Penitentiary. Sister Toronto, upon the return of the missionaries, wanted to care for the, them. She and her children were preparing to leave the country due to political conditions, and President Toronto had determined that all of them would have to leave soon. President Toronto noted, I had a big noon meal for them, but after a meager diet for 44 days, they couldn't, eat, they couldn't quite handle it even though it tasted so good, and they overate and became ill. The second day after the elders' release from prison, a cable came from the First Presidency instructing all of the missionaries to leave their mission and gather at Copenhagen, Denmark. The American Consul likewise issued a directive also encouraging the departure. Both arrived at the mission office the same day. Despite President Toronto's earlier resistance to leave the mission, he had seen the signs of impending war and had already begun the mechanism that would evacuate the mission. In a most interesting experience, all the missions in Europe received the same directive. President M. Douglas Wood of the West German Mission was packing books and other mission property in preparation for their departure from Frankfurt. He read in the mission history an account to his mission staff of the experiences of the missionaries leaving from the same countries 24 years earlier at the outbreak of World War II. Ironically, two of the missionaries got left behind. They had endured the takeover, the invasion of Russian troops. They were further reconquered by the German troops, and through it all, the missionaries witnessed a bloodbath on the streets of Tilsit in northeastern Germany. The following day after the elders' release from prison, while regular civilian train travel was still available, Sister Toronto and her two children and six-month-old infant left for Denmark. President Toronto sent some mission property and a large amount, nearly $3,000, with her. He felt that the government and border officials were less likely to search a woman with small children. Sister Toronto was not sure she wanted to do it, but was obedient and put the money, contrary to what she would have done, in her coat pocket rather than in her purse. A Jewish friend to the Torontos tipped the conductor of the train and asked her that she not be bothered until she had arrived, um, until the family arrived in Berlin. Since she didn't know her way around and didn't know how to make the connections in Berlin, Sister Toronto was met in Germany by an elder Lambert. He was assigned by the mission president in Germany to assist her to make, the certain, to make certain she made the proper travel connections and was settled on the train. On one occasion, Sister Toronto remembered, Elder Lambert placed me in a safe place and told me to stay there until the crowd had passed through the gates. 
She remained in her place while the missionary went ahead. He climbed the tall gate and jumped down on the other side. He was well down the platform before the gates were open, and the crowd, mostly Americans, making every effort to get home, surged in. Elder Lambert climbed aboard the train, saved her a compartment, stuck his head out of the window to direct the family to his position. She was able to remain in the compartment until she arrived in Copenhagen, since the train was pulled on, to, on board a ferry boat that floated her across the North Sea. After two days of travel, parts of two days of travel, the Torontos uh, were met in Copenhagen by missionary personnel. She and her children were housed in the Danish mission home with the Mark Garf family who had presided over the Copenhagen mission. But then came the hardest part of the whole experience for her. That is, waiting for her husband and the missionaries to come. President Toronto intended to follow his family within a, with the remainder of the released missionaries within a short time, but he had to delay his plans much longer than he expected. The elders were expected to get their visas and other exit documents. As they went to do so, Elder Payne was not allowed to get his exit visa. He, when he went to the government office to obtain it, he was rearrested. He was again taken into custody, frisked, strip searched, and re imprisoned by the Gestapo agents in the same present prison that he had come out of just days before. After sending the other elders on ahead to Denmark without him and Elder Payne, President Toronto, in company with the American consul, demanded an immediate investigation from the German government. Once again, no notification of his arrest, his whereabouts, or any charges were given to anyone. As a result of the diplomatic pressure and the urgency of President Toronto, the delegation learned that Elder Payne had been arrested because he had the same name as a, Brit a British spy that the Nazis were actively looking for. After verification of Payne's identity by President Toronto and the American consul representative, Elder Payne was released amid profuse apologies and was immediately granted his exit visa. President Toronto and Elder Payne departed from Czechoslovakia the same night. In retrospect, it was the only, the last time they could have departed. They put Elder Payne in the middle of the British representatives so that he could be kept safe and to avoid him being rearrested yet again. Sister Toronto had expand, uh, expected her husband and the rest of the missionaries to follow her arrival in Denmark within a few hours. But with delays of getting government approval and documents to exit the country and the rearrest of Elder Payne, their delay stretched into days. When, the other, when they had not come on the third day, she began to worry. And with each passing hour without news, her anxiety increased. She recorded, I was so worried and upset. We were watching all the news and the things which would come over the wires and the bulletins posted in the square in Copenhagen. And I'd come back to the mission home and I'd say to President Elder, to Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, Brother Smith, what am I going to do? He would put his arm lovingly around me and say, Sister Toronto, this war will not start until Brother Toronto and those missionaries get on Danish soil. Sister Evelyn Wood, the wife of the previously mentioned President Douglas Wood, remembered the same experience. She remembered the tense atmosphere in Copenhagen as they waited for news of the missing elders. The Woods had earlier evacuated their own missionaries, and some of them had followed them into, into Copenhagen. 
Some of the missionaries had evacuated to Switzerland, and others miraculously and against great odds arrived safely in Holland. Sister Woods recalled, Being rather naive, I said to Elder Smith, Do you mean to say that they would hold up a war? All the negotiations that are being made? while we get those missionaries out of there? It just didn't seem possible to me. He turned right to me and he said, Sister, the war will not start until those men are out of the country. End quote. Although it was very close timing, less than 24 hours time-wise, all of the missionaries made it out of Czechoslovakia before the German offensive began against Poland on the morning of September 1st. And, the war, and war was not declared by Great Britain and France against Germany until September 3rd, 1939. President Toronto and Elder Payne met the other missionaries in Berlin after they had had a day of sightseeing, and they came out on the last train over the last ferry boat across the North Sea to Copenhagen. While waiting in Copenhagen, Elder Smith would meet with the missionaries each day. First, they would have a report on conditions that existed in the countries the missionaries had recently come from. They would give a report, for example, of the progress of, the, of Elder, uh, President Toronto and the missionaries. Then Elder Smith would conduct a question and answer session among the missionaries that would typically last for two or three elder, uh, hours in the morning. The missionaries stayed in hotels with the members or in the mission home, a very spacious building which has since been rebuilt, refurbished, and rededicated as the Copenhagen Temple. The rest of the day, the missionaries were on their own with a lot of warnings about saying anything about legal conditions, but they were allowed to sightsee, go to museums, theaters, uh, eat, and all of them refer to eating, uh, and waited for others to come so that they would know what their plans were. During this time of great alarm, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith made two important prophecies and blessings. The first was, after the First Presidency determined that all the missionaries would be returned to America, he blessed them as a group, several hundred strong, that they would have no mishaps, that they would return safely, without harm or accident. That was realized. The second promise, he blessed Denmark because she had allowed the missionaries to come within her borders where other nations had closed their borders against them. Elder Orson West, the acting president of the Danish mission, was to mention after the, during the war, that that was that prophecy, that prediction, that blessing, was literally fulfilled, since Denmark was spared much of the catastrophe that war was poured out upon other nations. Elder Smith reported, there were in the European missions at this time 697 missionaries, 611 were elders. 63 were young women missionaries, and the other 23 were mission presidents, their wives, and children. These mission missionaries, he reported, returned in 23 ships, mostly freight boats, which had been improvised to care for the numerous passengers returning to America. In general conference, President J. Reuben Clark, Jr. noted, the whole group of missionaries was moved from the disturbed areas in Europe to the United States and thence either to their new fields of labor or to their home, homes without one accident 
or one serious case of sickness. The entire group was evacuated from Europe in three months, at a time when tens of thousands of Americans were besieging the ticket offices of the great steamship companies for passage. And the elders had no reservations. Every time a group was ready to embark, there was available the necessary space, even though efforts to reserve space just a few hours before had failed. In addition to the European missions, there were missionaries evacuated from South Africa, from South America, from the Syria mission, and from the Pacific mission. After 1843, the only areas of which new missionaries were being assigned were in Hawaii and North America. Um, President Harold B. Lee noted, uh, as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, in another general conference, quote, it is a matter of public record that hardly had the last missionaries been called home until all hell seemed to break loose in Europe in veritable fulfillment of the prophecies that had been given over the years before. Thank you.